students and parents tomorrow as well. So you don't really have to take notes um, because you can refer to the PowerPoint or the video if you choose to. So I am Kelly Redekin. I'm a counselor here at Juan Diego. And I was also the AP coordinator for about eight or nine years as well. So very familiar with our AP program. Um, and I do most of the college planning and preparation. Um, I'm working with all seniors now, but we'll do all junior college planning and all senior college planning, college meetings, all the college presentations, and getting started early as well. So if you have any college questions or anything specific you'd like to know, um, or if you really feel you'd like to meet at this stage in the game, I'm happy to do that if you have um, college questions, college plans, or some intense thoughts about college and you want to make sure you're on the right path as well, okay? So getting started early. So it's to give you specific ideas for things you can be doing now to prepare for junior year, senior year, and preparation for college. So what are the things you can do and what do you need to expect from colleges that you might be interested in, how competitive they might be, and where you sit as far as your academics are concerned. Um, and this will kind of help you make, make you feel more at ease. We kind of ease you into it from ninth grade, 10th grade, and then we amp it up a little bit more in 11th grade, and then obviously in senior year, you're prepared at that point with your college applications, your college list, and we use Naviance quite a bit, starting usually in sophomore year, and then it intensifies through senior year um, for our college planning and college lists and colleges I'm thinking about, but it is an excellent resource for all your college information and something you could use now if you wanted to start searching for colleges and see where you sit or where you need to sit for specific colleges you might be interested in. So do's and to do's. Know what colleges look for. So if you have a specific college in mind or you have a mindset about where you wanna be, know what the expectation is for that specific college. Am I taking the right classes? Am I heading on the right track as far as my GPA is concerned? Because the number one factor you will find is your transcript and the rigor of courses that you're taking. So tonight, um, we're talking about AP and then AP Capstone. We send a school profile to every college and university and we send the initial transcripts when you're applying to colleges. So they know what our school profile looks like as far as the classes we offer, as far as AP and honors level classes, and any extracurriculars, how many people are involved in extracurriculars, what our demographics are. So they get the whole enchilada of what Juan Diego looks like. And then they look at your transcript and they say, okay, based on what Juan Diego has to offer, how much did this student push themselves academically to meet those requirements, especially at a more competitive school? So you kind of want to see where you stand and if you're following that um, guideline as well. The top three criteria Rigor, as I just talked about, course selection. So they're gonna wanna make sure that you're pushing yourself as much academically as you can or you have the ability to do with honors and AP if you're considering um, more restrictive applications or colleges that are harder to get into. So you wanna make sure that that's your number one factor. Even at the University of Utah, rigor is the number one factor that they look through um, and I'll go um, on with that as well. Grades, GPA, and ACT and SAT scores. So obviously, getting an A in an honors or an AP class is the best thing you can do, but I still believe if you're pushing yourself with academic rigor, sometimes when you're taking AP classes, you might get the first B that you've ever had, and that's hard for some students to stomach when they've always done extremely well, have always been a 4.0, but AP is, is a hard level of class. So you might face a lower grade than you are used to. But if you've pushed yourself with rigor and you're taking honors in AP and they see the trend on your transcript that you have pushed yourself and you're doing well and you had a B in an AP class, they still think that that's pretty solid and a good grade. So I don't want you to overly stress about that. This year, for this application year, for our seniors due to COVID, so many were not able to take ACT and SATs tests at all. So most every college across the country and universities went test optional. So they didn't even consider test scores because they didn't have them available to look at. 
as far as GPA test scores and other things that you might do as well. So many, I've received so many emails recently that are gonna continue that trend for next year as well. Um, for this class, ninth and 10th graders, you're likely going to have to get back into the ACT, SAT track, which we prepare you for. All the ninth, 10th, and 11th graders are gonna be taking the pre-ACT on March 4th. So coming up, it's during the school day, which is gonna be helpful in preparation for the ACT. And some of you sophomores may have taken um, the PSAT in October if you qualified as a certain, you had to be in Algebra two honors or higher in order to take the PSAT as a sophomore. And you'll take the PSAT, every junior takes the PSAT in your junior year in October as well, because it's a nationally set test date for all juniors across the country. So there's a few things coming up, and we try to prepare you in 9th and 10th grade taking the pre-ACT, and now Dr. Colosimo wants the juniors to take the pre-ACT, so you have more opportunities to get practice under your belt, so you're prepared when you have to take the real thing. And we offer the ACT here in um, September, October, and June, but then you can take it at any, any of the other schools across the valley, pretty much. Um, they offer it seven times a year now, so we offer it three times, but there's obviously other options that you can take it as well. So just be prepared that you're probably gonna have to take it, but I really feel like what admission people are talking about now is what they're going to find is the classes that they've entered, like for this year without test scores and possibly next, next year without test scores, they're still gonna get the same caliber of students that are gonna do just as well because they proved themselves academically or holistically with everything they've been involved with. And I feel like the trend is gonna to be to go away from ACTs and SAT scores. Like the um, UC application is now thinking they're gonna have their own test within the UC system, and they don't want any test scores anymore. So everyone's starting to kind of push to that trend, which I think is somewhat better because you are not your test score. What you've done in the classroom, what you do extracurricularly, there's a lot of things going on with the bigger picture, your letters of recommendation, your college essay is a huge part of your application. So just focusing on a test score of how well you might do in a college or university setting, I don't think is the best indicator of long-term success. So getting involved outside of what you do in the classroom, which is the number one factor, making sure that you're getting involved in something on campus, whether it be you know, music or drama or athletics or campus life, student government, being involved with some clubs or groups, anything where you're showing yourself as well-rounded. If you only like one thing and you put all your energy and time into that, don't think you have to do 50 million things. If you really have a vested interest in music and that's where you wanna put all your focus, that's okay too. They see that maybe that's something that you have done intensely and you did it for all four years and it was sort of your passion and maybe even speak about it in your college essay, that's okay. If you are doing any volunteer work outside of school or you spend a lot of time working at the Humane Society, for example, and you love animals, people think, I have to do all these different volunteer hours all over the place. If you really have a focus in one area and that's what you love, schools will see that and it will become one of those things that shows in your application that that's a passion of yours and maybe they see that as a good fit for their college or university. As we talked about with service and or paid employment, I love it when students have had summer jobs or maybe have worked a part-time job on the weekends during the school year. I know it can be hard to do, but sometimes that shows commitment, that you have responsibility, you're showing up on time, you're taking care of business, and I think colleges like to see that as well. So if you're doing things like that, that's a wonderful thing also. Essays and letters of recommendation. In your senior year, we get you ready out of the gate in your English classes um, for college essays. Most, well there's a thousand schools now in the Common Application. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the Common App, but it's one general Common Application, which now a thousand schools belong to, where you'll do a general Common Application at those schools and you might have specified questions and or extra essays for specified schools that you add in your Common App list. Um, and uh, the Common App does require an essay. The UC application has many smaller essays that you'd have to do as well. So we do a lot of pre preparation for essays for your college applications, but it is something to think about. Think about your story. Think about what could bring your application to life. If you are sitting two applications 
and each of you have a 3.98. You've taken tons of AP and honors level classes. You have an excellent ACT or SAT score. Um, you've been pretty much heavily involved. You know, what's gonna be the deciding factor for that college or university? And sometimes it's how your essay brings your application to life. So something could be something little. I've had great essays that students have written about their gold soccer shoes and how that brought them through their whole life of soccer and what that shoe meant to them, or talked about their first kiss, or something as simple as that that really brought their essay to life and got them into a great school just based on having just something a little, a little bit out of the box. Um, the other thing is letters of recommendation. So usually on average, there's about three to four letters of recommendation per each school, depending upon the institution, of letters of recommendation that they will accept. So make sure you think about the teachers that know you best and how well you do academically in their classroom. And you start thinking about, you know, it doesn't matter if it's someone from ninth grade that you connected with on a great level, or if it's someone in your senior year that you felt like you want to write your letter of recommendation. Um, Dr. Celestino and Ms. Mrs. Clark are in here right now. I'm sure they've had plenty of their students from ninth grade all the way to 12th grade that they've had in their classes that have requested to write letters of recommendation because there's nobody that can speak to your abilities better than teachers. Even if they've had you a few years back, it's totally fine. So you kind of think about that and who can really understand what you bring to the table as far as academics are concerned. And then usually the counselors write a letter as well and I started meeting with juniors and seniors to get you ready on that path, and then there's a lot of questions. And on my end, I'm not speaking to your academics, usually it's more personal, so I'll get insight from parents. We do questionnaires from students. So there's some things I can speak about in my letter of recommendation that I wouldn't otherwise know about your student just on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really helpful for the parents to give me feedback on this is something that you should know about my daughter or son that would be helpful for a letter of recommendation. Then, just other criteria, um, if you have legacies, sometimes that can be helpful to um, competitive institution, um, institutional needs, so maybe they haven't had students from Utah for a while, and they really want to beef up that demographic, or they want more diversity, or whatever it might be, you could be the student that year that they're looking for, so you never know. Don't always look straight at, okay, here's the, AP, here's the ACT, here's the GPAs, it doesn't look like maybe I'm gonna hit the mark for that. You never know what can happen. I've seen a lot of crazy things happen at highly competitive schools. Um, if you have a really well-rounded application, a great essay, some great letters of recommendation, an interesting backstory, whatever it might be, you'd be surprised what can happen sometimes. So don't always just you know throw it out if you feel like you haven't met the mark academically. So there's just other things, leadership and little things that might come into play. So public versus private. So a lot of public colleges are in the Common App, but a lot are not. For example, Utah State's not in the Common App, and Southern Utah University's not in the Common App, and some other you know, uh, state schools as well. So you'll complete their application, which you can do on their website, and then we, you would send test scores and we send transcripts. It's a pretty simple application. The Common App's a little more intensive, so you'll be completing the whole common application, which is a lot of detailed information that you have to enter, all your classes, grades, and we upload transcripts and letters of recommendation, as I talked about, and the essays, you'll list all your activities, any community involvement, all of those things would be considered on the application side for the common app or a more intensive application. Some, like the slick application only takes kids about 20, 25 minutes, it's pretty simple. But the common app, kids usually are working on for quite a while because you'll have extra essays and a lot of preparation and planning. The Common App's not something you would start the night before and think you can get all your applications submitted by certain deadlines. So make sure we're you know, preparing for that. And some of the early deadlines in your senior year will be November 1st, sometimes 12-1 for early action deadlines. And then some of the regular decisions could be, you could apply if you decided to add a school, which I've had a lot of seniors do sometimes. They'll hear back, hear back from all their schools that they applied early action. And maybe they've been accepted to seven out of the 10 that they applied to. But maybe the scholarships not, were not quite where they needed to be or they felt like maybe that wasn't gonna work. So they decided I'm gonna apply to the University of Arizona in April because they have a regular decision deadline in April. And then they end up getting a great scholarship there. 
and that's where they end up going. So there's a lot of things that can happen in your application process where you could still apply to some schools on a later deadline and could be a good fit for you in the end. So just to give you some breakdown of some of the admission standards, um, I've just done a couple here. So the University of Utah is more competitive than it's ever been. Um, last year, they had, I think, what was the, the total? I can't remember what the total was. So the entering class was 4,400, but the average middle 50 GPA was a 3.4 to a 3.93, and the ACT was a 22 to a 29, and the SAT 1140 to a 1340. So that's more competitive than it's ever been. Anybody that's been below a 3.0 recently has been usually denied from the University of Utah, unless there may be more special circumstances or they had a great amount of uh, rigor or something else was going on. And as I talked about, even um, at schools that you might not think, one of the biggest things that they look for is grade trends, QM GPA, excellence in academic achievement, intellectual pursuits and creative endeavors, and satisfactory completion of recommended high school courses. You'll automatically meet the recommended courses from what we have students take and what we require. We require over and above what the public school system does. So you'll meet those requirements for that. You wouldn't have to worry about that as all, as, at all. But let's say they see our school profile, they see what you've taken, if a public school student was taking just all academic classes and had a 4.0, but a Juan Diego student was taking AP and honors and had a 3.5, that's who they're gonna take because you have pushed yourself with academic rigor. Your GPA might not be as high, but you're doing much harder work than someone who's just taking all academic classes. So here's Utah State. A lot of uh, the in-state schools like SUU, Utah State, they'll just do a grid system. So you'll see that this is a 36 at the top and a 4.0. If you're in that purple range, you get full tuition covered for all four years and then it sort of breaks down tuition-wise that way. But the whole gray area, you're still admitted. So they will accept students at a 2.7 and even in the 18 um, ACT range. But the higher you go and the higher your test scores, higher GPA is more scholarship money, which is pretty much general across the board. Then we go to look at a school like USC and Stanford. Highly competitive schools to get into. So USC um, has an 11% acceptance rate, number five in California for lowest rate of acceptance. Last year, um, they had 66,000 applications and accepted 7,500 about. On average, most of those kids are in that, you know, three, six, three, seven, three, eight, three, nine, four O's, mainly close to the four O range, and have pushed themselves with academic rigor and been heavily involved, you know, as far as the whole package is concerned. And the average ACT was a 31 to a 34, and a 1360 to a 1530. So pretty competitive, but we've also had a ton of kids admitted to USC that have done extremely well. Um, and sometimes, you know, they might have a competitive school, but let's say you have a special talent. We've had students that, um, you know, maybe you would have a great application, but 11% acceptance rate, you're not sure where you're gonna fall. You, so you could still not get in, even if you have everything that you need. But if you have a special talent, like maybe you're a debater or something that USC, since it's a private institution, is looking for, then that would help increase your chances of getting admitted. So we've had a lot of students that have had special talents to Stanford or USC that have helped, and maybe they haven't hit the full mark, but that special talent helps them get in as well. And then I have just Stanford down here. Um, they're ranking number one with a 4% acceptance rate, which is really ridiculous. Um, they, got, they had 47,000 application and accepted 2,000. Very low chance of acceptance, even for applicants with the highest scores um, and GPAs. But we've had kids get into Stanford as well, sometimes with special talents, sometimes not. A lot of times we always joke that you would have had to create your own um, nonprofit in eighth grade, that you have changed the world and made such a huge difference that it's a little bit, it's pretty crazy. Um, 
the intensity of some of the students that I know have gotten in or from other institutions that have gotten in. So I would never say don't apply because like I said, you never know that near what they might be looking for. And it could be you, it could be someone from Utah, it could be someone from Juan Diego. And that's why I would say, don't not apply if that's something you've always wanted to do because you never know what may happen. So right now in your freshman and sophomore year, the, the most important thing you can do is what I started out with is taking the hardest classes you can take or that you can handle. So only push yourself to what you feel you can handle. And your teachers are a good sounding board for that. So we're gonna be handing out our registration forms shortly in the next couple weeks. Teachers will sign off on those things. So then you might have a conversation with that teacher, with your social studies teacher. Do you think I could handle honors next year? Do you think I could handle AP next year? Whatever it might be, make sure you have that conversation. They know what you're capable of. They've seen what you can do in the classroom. So make sure you ask them and see. And, and if, you're, if you've taken the PSA, PSAT, it will tell you based on your scores on the PSAT, we think you can handle these AP classes. And some people might shy away from that, thinking, well, I don't know, maybe it's gonna be too hard, maybe I can't do it. You'd be surprised. If you get in there and it's a subject you love, push yourself and take it. It's gonna help you in the long run and help you prepare for college as well. So um, check out your interests, look at things you might be interested in, encourage the challenge, get involved with things. These are really important things to do. Um, Create an activities record. We will start doing a resume in junior year, so you have that in Naviance as well, which really helps you for your college applications. But you can start keeping track of that now. Keep a Google Doc of everything you've done in school, all the things so you don't forget those little things that you've done that maybe you helped with mass planning, maybe you were on student faith and liturgy. You just gotta have all those things sort of stacked up um, that are important for college applications. So this is just a little, Cartoon. We want you to have fun, as long as it's fun that enhances a college admission application. So it's a little over the top because there's so much pressure um, that you have to do this, you have to do this, and you have to be the best at everything to make sure you have that solid application. You just do you. You do the best you can do. Don't feel completely pressured and overwhelmed because you have to find the best fit for you. If you've always had a mindset at a, at, about a specific school, maybe that will be a good fit, but maybe once you go visit that campus, or you really think about it, or you experience what they have to offer, maybe it won't be the best fit for you. So this is the time to explore those kinds of um, options. So visit. Right now, visiting has not been good because of COVID. So most of the schools have now amped up their virtual visits better than I've ever seen. Um, and you can also access virtual visits and colleges and the demographics and students from Juan Diego that have applied and what their GPAs and test scores are, all on Naviance. You can do all of this in Naviance, but you can also do it in many other ways as well by searching the internet, um, tons of virtual visits. But as you guys get closer to application season, you'll be able to visit campuses. And there's tons of ways you can do it. When my daughter was, freshman, sophomore, if we were on a trip somewhere, I'd say, let's just go walk this campus. Let's go check out this campus or that campus. Or I try to set something up. Even in ninth grade, I would do that. Just because we happen to be in an area, why not go check out a campus? And we could knock out maybe three or four sometimes in an area. It doesn't take that long either to set up a visit or just walk a campus and you get a feel of, you know, if, if it's your thing or not. Um, and pretty easy to tell. And kids usually have a pretty good gut feeling about that. Um, sometimes when school's not in session, you don't get the feel for what the student body's doing or if there's not a lot of hubbub on the campus, sometimes that can be harder to see. But um, it is important to check out a campus. Um, so if you can do virtual visits now, that's great. But when you guys, you guys are actually in a better circumstance because you'll be able to actually see those campuses. So a lot of people do it leading up to all their college applications. Some people will apply to the schools they want to once they know they've been admitted, then they visit, because then you really know, I'm in, I know how much money they're offering me, and now I'm gonna look at the school a little differently. If you've been offered an unbelievable scholarship somewhere that you didn't think you'd get as much money, and then you go visit that campus, and everything starts to make sense, and it makes sense financially, then it's like, wow, I think I could really see myself there. And believe it or not, there are more than one place you can be happy in college. So don't rule out a bunch of things just because you've had a specific mindset. It's a good time in your life to start exploring all of those options. 
So spring break, summer, long weekends, family vacations, all those different kinds. Um, and if you can't go out of state, if you're not going to be on a trip, if you even went to the University of Utah and Westminster in one day, you'd have a good idea. Here's a large school that's over 35,000 students. Westminster's about 3,000 students. It's a vastly different feel of campuses. So just even visiting those two campuses, you get an idea. Would I want to be on a bigger campus or a smaller campus? And what do each one of these institutions have to offer me and what's a good setting for me? So those are things to think about when you're doing visits as well. Take appropriate tests. Like I said, we're doing the pre-ACT. All juniors will take the PSAT unless you are in Algebra II honors or higher in your sophomore year, then you'll be invited to take it your sophomore year as well. Um, the best test prep is being in class and doing as well as you can in your class and pushing yourself because the ACT and SAT always say juniors should wait to take the ACT or SAT you know, in the spring of their junior year so you have more classroom time and more exposure in the classroom. And I will tell you our reading program has increased our test scores greatly. So also reading is very helpful to improving your test scores because the ACT and SAT, all in, even the math, reading, 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 reading. So the higher your comprehension is, the faster you're able to read questions, all those kinds of things come into play and can be very helpful in that way as well. And then there's a lot of free things you can do online to do test prep, but there's tons of more expensive options as well, but that's what you would decide as a family if that's what you needed to do. Then the most affordable test prep, as I just talked about, is reading. All these other things don't really help as much, but reading a book and just kind of getting that comprehension is highly helpful. Okay? I know that doesn't sound exciting to a lot of people, but it's the truth. Okay, some don'ts. Um, you don't need to know what you want to study right now or what you want to be for the rest of your life. Um, it's, it's just too much pressure sometimes to have that thought. I took um, a psychology class in high school, and right then and there I knew that I wanted to major in psychology, and then I got my master's in mental health counseling and then school counseling. Um, I just That's just the way it happened for me. It doesn't happen that way for most people. You don't need to know. You have plenty of time in your first two years to take your um, general classes that you have to take and then move into your major, usually in your last two years. So there's not a lot of pressure to um, know that now. But there's ways to process some of that. You can do the career interest profiler in, in Naviance, and that can be really helpful to help you decide maybe some career choices that you hadn't considered and what majors are linked to those careers. So there's a lot of ways you can start exploring those things, but it's not something you need to know today. Um, rely on a single score, a source for like the best schools for engineering or whatever it might be. You can explore some of those options, but a lot of those things that come up in US News and World Report, usually there's some sort of financial gain one way or the other to get a higher ranking. So make sure you're digging a little deeper to find out that information. Expect perfection. You just got to be you and do the best you can do. So not a lot of pressure and intensity. I know there's a lot of students that put a lot of pressure on themselves. Um, but just, you know, you got to relax and then just enjoy the process and do what you can do. And enjoy high school. That's what you're here for. The academics are really important. But make sure that you're having fun, too, and you're making friends and getting involved in things that make you happy. Let the price tag fool you. It's... It is crazy how expensive schools are. So on average, like a Notre Dame, is gonna be $75,000 a year. But some of the most competitive schools to get into have the highest endowments, and you'd be surprised at the amount of scholarship money they might offer for um, your students. So that initial price tag is usually not what it would be in the end. Sometimes it can be too much in the end, but you'd be surprised at how much it cuts down based on your merit, what you've done academically, um, financial aid, if you qualify for financial aid or free money, then they do the merit-based aid that you might receive, and then your financial aid, and then it cuts it down quite a bit. So the sticker shock is, is shocking, but don't always take it that way. Um, like I said, the most expensive schools often have the most financial assistance. Assistance, start saving now if you haven't already. Some of you have done really well with planning and preparing and having college plans in place, but some people, it just hits you like a 
a ton of bricks in uh, the senior year, and then you get the reality of what it looks like, but that helps make your choices as a family. If you've worked really hard, and this institution, you like three of the schools you've been accepted to, but one has offered you a lot of money because you've worked really hard, and maybe the other ones haven't offered as much, and you know you could be happy there too, I always say, wouldn't you want to be a place that wants you and is offering you a great amount of money? And if you want to make a sacrifice for one of those other schools, you know, obviously that's up to you. But these are the things you start weighing as things get um, down the line. And begin looking for scholarships now. We start, usually in junior year, there's a lot of scholarships that might come up that juniors can apply to. And I send those out via emails to the students. And then in senior year, I'm sending out, how many emails do I send out a week about scholarships? Uh, yeah, three or four a week at least of scholarships. And you might meet the criteria one day, the next day you might not, but at least it's worth looking into and can be, you know, $500 here, $3,500 there, $5,000 here. So those outside scholarships can be really helpful as well. And there's other options to look for money and financial aid. Um, we give, we have all of these in Naviance as well but there's tons of links for scholarships that you can create accounts and start doing that. But closer to your junior year, you don't need to start as early now, but you could start exploring some of those if you wish to do so. So those are some options. So um, the planning for college, I will send this in a link tomorrow. It's just the junior college planning packet, but it is good information to start early so you kind of know what's coming up and what you need to start preparing for. It just has a lot of great information. Um, just kind of a year-by-year -year to do list so that you're ready when the time comes So no, let's not go into the next one Elise Oh Is that the last page on that one? Okay all right, so we're going to jump into AP next, and then we'll have the capstone. People start as soon as I just go through the basics of AP. So we'll get at the next PowerPoint ready to roll. Okay, so preparing now to succeed in college. So obviously if you take AP classes um, at Juan Diego, they can be a huge benefit to you down the road. Not only are you sitting in a college level class in high school, taught by our teachers, but you have the potential to earn college level credit. Even if you don't pass the test in May that is done by the college board with a three, four, five, or sometimes four and five to get the credit for some colleges and universities, having an AP class on your transcript and showing that rigor, they know that you have been in a college level class and pushed yourself um, academically. So that's hugely important. In fact, the colleges won't even know what scores you have on your AP tests unless you choose to send your scores um, when you apply to that school where you've been admitted. So if you do well, great. If you don't, the experience is hugely important. Okay, what's the difference between AP and honors? So AP courses are the only courses designed and updated by the college board and college professors to pre reflect what's being taught in college level courses. Students receive an external evaluation, which is the test I talked about that you take in May, which is by the college board that the students take. It's like taking a college level exam. They're all in the gym. It's set one day. It's nationally set test date and time. It generally takes about three to four hours for each one of those exams, but you spend your whole year pretty much in the classroom in preparation for the AP exam that you'll take in a, spe a specified subject. So then it's scored by college and faculty from around the world. In fact, um, are you, have you been a reader? So Dr. Celestino's been a reader. I know Mrs. Jacobs been a reader. Have you done it too, Amanda? So we have our teachers who are reading other students' exams from across the country as well, which is beneficial for them and their subjects to see how other students are answering questions or how they're doing their essays or FRQs but it really is helpful for them to see what's going on outside of their classroom and what other students are doing. Um, and then we kind of get feedback on our students as well, which is really important. So who designs these? These are all the different colleges, Dartmouth, Hamilton, UCLA, UT, um, 
teach at dozens of the nation's top colleges and universities that design the AP exams that are being given in May after you complete an AP course. So you put your knowledge to the test. So what happens is you will sometimes clef out of credit or you can advance to a higher level um, when you get to college based on your scores on an AP exam. So if you finish the course, you did well, you can graduate. Some, we've had a lot of our kids that have started as sophomores with all the AP credits that they've received. A lot of our kids that are in CAPS don't kind of end up on a trend of sometimes 10, 12, up to 15 AP classes they could take by the time they graduate. So if you think of that, if they passed all those AP exams um, and all sometimes your credit, just with one AP class, if you could clep out of like a three or four credit class, that adds up. And what it adds up mostly to is thousands of dollars. So you'll pay for your AP exam here to take the test. And then if you get that credit, and if you're able to jump to a higher level of class in college, you're now you know, skipping a, almost a whole year of credit if you have that many AP credits. That's a lot of money you're saving in college credits that you've done in high school. So that's one of the really beneficial things outside of just the experience of having a college level course that you've taken. Then you're sitting in a freshman level class and it, it doesn't seem so overwhelming. A lot of our kids will come back that have been on the AP track and say, it hasn't been that bad. I, I feel like I can handle it. It hasn't been an issue thanks to the preparation I had at Juan Diego. So what's the difference between credit and placement? So some colleges will award credit for qualifying AP exam grades. That means if you get a three, four, it's, it's ranged from a one to a five on the AP exam. A lot of schools will take threes, fours, and fives to get the credit, some fours and fives, and every once in a while there'll be a, a school, like a highly competitive school that will only take a five in AP calculus to get the credit. Um, and usually that's because they want you to go on that math track for a spe specified major within the AP program and the college board, which can be great for your college applications if you have passed all of those. Um, you experience a college level test, you'll be a step ahead. And for these reasons, anybody that takes an AP class at Juan Diego is expected to take the AP class, uh, AP test in, the, in May, okay? So factors in influencing admissions and decisions, which I talked about with getting started early. If you see the most considerable um, importance and factor, like I talked about with rigor, is grades in college prep courses. So taking honors and AP and pushing yourself as much as you can academically. Rigor is hugely important. So this kind of does a breakdown of what they consider important for um, admission factors. Um, who should take the AP course as an exam? So Juan Diego uses the AP program's official policy for AP enrollment, which is all students that are really passionate and have done pretty well in those academic courses, and you've talked to your teacher about they feel like you can handle it, um, we would give you that chance to take that class. Uh, I hate to you know, say you absolutely can't handle it. Some people get in and they feel like they're in over their head, but we just have a small window to be able to drop that class. You're pretty much committed to AP after the first two weeks of school starting. So make sure you understand what you're getting into and talk to your teachers and what you're capable of doing. But you'd be surprised if it's a subject that you love that you can handle it. So these are the AP courses that are offered at Juan Diego, 20, over 24. And I think we're even increasing by the moment, it seems like there's even more um, now. But you can definitely find a course that you love. If you love English or social studies or science, you can find an AP class that's um, on that level. And you definitely want to take, if you don't like math and maybe math's not your thing, you don't want to be taking AP Calculus AB. You'll be crying the whole way through it. But if you love English, AP Lang and AP Lit in your junior and senior year is the way to go because if you do well in that subject, you're gonna probably excel in, in both of those AP classes. So make sure it's a class that you have enjoyed in the academic or honors level and push yourself in AP. How do I register for an AP class? 
We're going to send out the registration form shortly, and then you'll talk to your teachers. They'll have to sign off um, that you've had that kind of conversation with them, that you can be in that level of AP. And like I said, make sure it's a subject that you really enjoy, because you're going to have to do a lot of reading. If you don't love AP European history, right, and you have to do, how much reading do you have to do, Mrs. Clark? A lot. So it's intensive. So you better make sure you like history and you like AP European history because in preparation for her quizzes and exams and AP exams, you do have to read a lot. So just make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, uh, review the AP course prerequisites. We have our course guide that will come out and you'll know what classes you had to have prior to signing up for that AP exam. And um, be careful. Sometimes what happens these guys are going to talk about Capstone, which is a, a great program that we have in leading you into the whole program. A lot of our freshmen will start with AP Art History, and then they'll progress to um, AP Seminar and kind of increase from there. So freshman, sophomore year, you can take a couple, and then you might amp up in your junior year where you can start taking a lot more. Um, and some of our kids will jump from, you know, maybe they had two, and they'll go to five in their junior year. That can be pretty overwhelming. Some kids have no problem handling it. But amping up that much from two to five can, you know, if you're having to read a lot for any one of your um, social studies AP classes, for example, and you're taking four others that are pretty intensive, you gotta think about how you're gonna manage all of that um, and, and what's gonna be a good balance for you. So make sure you understand that as well. And give your, um, your parents then will approve your registration form. So after your teachers have signed off, you want to make sure and have a conversation with your parents about the expectations and if you feel like you can handle that as well. What you need to consider, um, you will sign a contract and once you've decided you want to be in an AP class that you're committed to the class and what the expectations are in that class. So if you are, you know, waffling at all, you really need to think about that and wonder if you are committed and if this is something you want to do. Uh, most of the AP courses have summer reading and a lot of requirements, which is good preparation for starting out as well. AP seminar in particular, it's one of our hardest classes as far as the expectation. So make sure you're ready for that and that you're going to have a commitment for work in the summer. Um, all AP courses are all year long, so you cannot drop a class after the course begins and you must take the exam in May. And then understand, maybe if you're taking a few more AP courses, I said rigor's important, but you might face your first B, which can be pretty frightening to some students. But a B is okay. I promise you, you will be okay. Um, okay, so the cost for AP research and AP seminar, it's $149 per exam, and all other AP exams are $99 per exam. That was this year. I don't know if it's going to adjust because sometimes they adjust every year. That's to develop, print, shift, and score the exams, teacher training, classroom resources, and support educational initiatives. But most of our money goes right back to the college board with a big fat check that's written in May after everybody takes their um, AP exams. Then, if you're interested, one of the best ways is not only talking to your teachers, talk to your friends. Let them tell you the truth about what it's really like in that AP class, or what it feels like, or how much, how much homework did you really have for AP US history? Did you have an hour and a half a night, or just an hour a night? What if, you know, just the real deal of what that's like. They're the people that are going to help you in that way, but the teachers as well for the expectation. Um, and then you can talk to one of your counselors if you have a question. You can always come to me if you have questions about what you want to do and what you might be interested in doing as well. Then additional ways to earn college credit. We also offer concurrent courses and we have our AESU blended learning courses where you can also get that credit after you've taken the class when you pay an extra fee and get that. But you're um, simultaneously enrolled at UVU and Juan Diego. You're taught by our professors and you get college credit for our concurrent classes. So we have, um, I don't know, maybe five or six concurrent classes right now. Think about that many. Yeah, probably a, a handful or more. So different ways and that's more of like, it's not as intense as an AP course, but still pretty, I mean, Mr. Hauser teaches concurrent. So compared to AP, how would you consider concurrent to AP? Yeah, 
So still more like an honors level class, but not as intense as AP, mainly because you don't have that end of the year class. So resource information, like I said, you can go and check out the colleges that you're interested in and what they offer as far as the AP policy is concerned, concerned but anything on the college board will give you information about AP, and of course your best resources are your AP teachers and or your counselors. Thanks so much for your time. Now you get the best part of the presentation because the students give you the real deal. Thanks so much. successful and controversial directors in the modern age. Is the curtain closing on it? Hi, I'm Mr. White, this is Mr. Pink, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Blue. And in this brief summary of our AP presentation, we will be studying this question. We explored the question, does Quentin Tarantino deserve to be known as an auteur? And our resolution to this was a resounding yes, due to the way he uniquely portrays violence, themes, style, and race. Now, the definition of an auteur is generally known as a director who exerts a high level of control across all aspects of their films. Um, they usually have other roles, such as writing, editing, or acting, and they normally have a consistent style throughout their films. We're, go we're going to be investigating the question through five lenses, gender, Gender, violence, style and themes, race, and comparison. So starting off with the gender lens, Tarantino, some people believe that Tarantino portrays his women in his movies as overly sexualized and victimized, as well as treats them too harshly on set, so he does not deserve praise. But we came to the conclusion that since Tarantino portrays sexism and feminism so stylized in his movies, he does deserve the title of auteur. So the women in Django Unchained, as James Crank, an assistant professor at the, at the University of Alabama States, are marginalized by a white paternal heteronormative culture where they reimagine and mediate their own empowerment through the southern formations, showing a sort of sexual empowerment here. Later in the movie, the Brittle Brothers speak to a woman named Jody seductively as they prepare her for a whipping just for dropping eggs, showing an unrealistic and overemphasized sexism. Another example of this overemphasized sexism is seen through Pulp Fiction, where Wallace's wife needs the constant aid of Vincent throughout the movie, especially when she overdoses. This is showing how women need this constant aid of men. But then we see the topic of female masculinity seen in Tarantino's movies, which is rarely ever portrayed. Tarantino seems to be representing himself and these women and their actions are re representing his ideas, such as in Kill Bill, where the main woman is raped while she's in a coma, and once she wakes, wakes up, she seeks vengeance on her rapist, going as graphically as ripping out the tongue on one of them and killing them with their sword. This is showing an individualized, strong woman which catches people off guard, and Tarantino doesn't leave these roles just for men. Oh, uh, so this makes Tarantino unique through him showing overemphasized sexism, female masculinity, and feminism so strongly, which isn't normally portrayed in other movies. We have a few limitations to our question. Firstly, Tarantino has made a limited amount of movies. He's only made nine of them. Secondly, the definition of auteur is highly debated. And finally, why do we care about these questions? Because these are just movies. Thank you. So those gentlemen just completed their research project um, as a group, and they're now currently working on their individual papers. So their presentation was not quite what you would think of as traditionally academic, but they found a topic that they were interested in, and they had to argue it by finding evidence to support their argument. My name is Vanessa Jacobs. I am the uh, Juan Diego Academy's coordinator, 
and I also teach AP Art History and AP World History. Today we have joining us Dr. Celestino, she teaches AP Research, and then Dave Hauser teaches AP Seminar. But the best speakers of our capstone program are the students. So tonight we have Kirsten Sumapal, and she will have a student perspective with several students also telling you about the program, what they've learned, what they may have researched, and Kirsten will also tell us the various components of it. At the end, you'll have plenty of time to ask questions. So right now, just see what these students have and their own personal experience. So Kirsten, I'll ask her to come up now. She is a senior. She is graduating as an AP Capstone candidate, which means that she has successfully com completed AP seminar and AP research and three AP classes, and she's currently in her final AP courses this year as a senior. Can we get our slides up? So my name is Kirsten Sumopong, and again, you just heard from Mrs. Jacobs, I am currently a senior who have successfully completed AP Seminar and AP Research. So AP Seminar is a class that you take your sophomore year where you research various topics such as the ones you just saw with our Tarantino boys. For me personally, I decided to look at um, my first group project was on the Industrial Revolution. My second was on Utah's high-end suicide rates. And my last final presentation was on online internet culture. So one of my favorites was, in fact, the, how Utah's the suicide rates are a lot higher, and I looked at this through an environmental lens. AP Seminar really provided me that opportunity to look into an issue that I thought was really important, and I, with in tying it in with the environmental lens, which I also thought was really important that we need to research. After following uh, AP Seminar, I went into AP research directly following that, and I had the opportunity to look at this, at, um, work at the University of Utah in a lab with Shelly Mintier. In this AP research lab, I researched the biosynthesis of multi-metal nanoparticles in a single catalyst solution. And yes, that sounds complicated, but really it's just making a bunch of metals in a solution with catalase, which is just an, which is just an enzyme. Uh, through these, this opportunity of being able to take AP Seminar and AP Research, I have really had just a plethora of experiences just offered to me, not only just academically, but also socially and just mentally and everything like that. For example, with AP Research, with working at the lab at the University of Utah, I was able to have my name added to a list of authors for a published journal on this, um, on this topic, which is an opportunity that I don't think you would be able to get anywhere else through any other program. And if that's not just a little hint of a reason to take it, I promise you there's gonna be so much more and you will hear the rest of it tonight. So the question is, what is AP Capstone? AP Capstone is a program that Juan Diego provides that allows you to take uh, three major components. First is AP Seminar. AP Seminar is taken in your sophomore year and is when you are able to look through a variety of lenses and learn through research, very rigorous research I will say, and learn how to present. This is the class where I learned how to present and how to read and become the student I am today. I can say that 100%. I can tell you I would not be standing here I would, but without the experience that I learned with AP Seminar. Had I otherwise, I think I would be trembling, I would be terrified, but AB Seminar gave me the confidence and gave me the skills that got me to that place. Then you can take AP Research your junior or senior year. AP Research is when you take one part, one research question for the rest of the year and you look at it uh, to create one uh, 20 page paper and a presentation. 
This is a really uh, wonderful opportunity because you can really end up looking at like a single topic and know the ins and outs of it. It's a, just a wonderful opportunity. And in order to complete the AP Capstone program, it is important that you take four other additional AP classes. Luckily, you just heard that Juan Diego offers about 25 other various AP classes, and I believe that most of you here are, have taken AP Art History, and as long as you successfully complete AP Art History, that it means you only need three more to go. Um, so why should we take AP Capstone? Other than the fact that it te teaches you so many academic skills, AP Capstone as a program puts you far ahead of any other students in the country who are going to be applying in college. So previously before, AP Capstone was in, um, on the a Common App application, which is an application where you fill out one form and be able to be sent to, to several colleges, but now it is now in the Common App. So the Common App so on the Common App, the AP Capstone Diploma is also a student that I know that you guys can be. Um, so if, with the details of AP Seminar, you need to take AP World along with AP Seminar. With AP Seminar and AP World, they will continue to investigate real world and historical issues from multiple perspectives in both classes. That way you can really double up the strength of what you need to learn. And uh, students will learn to collaborate and create two major written works that will be submitted to the College Board in May. After this, you can choose to take AP Research in your junior or senior year. In this this will be considered your elective credit, and students will build on their researching and their writing skills that were learned in AP Seminar and create an independent research in order to produce and defend a scholarly word thesis, senior thesis. Really, I've been told this before, but it's really like a mini graduate program as a junior. It's going to put you far ahead. Luckily, we have a the best team, I have to say, of, stu of teachers to lead us through the AP Capstone program. First, we have Mrs. McConnell, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with AP research, oh, excuse me, with AP art history. Mer Mrs. McConnell is our AP Capstone curriculum director, and she um, has been ahead of the game with teaching online. Um, so with her online, she is able to help and give advice, help guide you through the, all of your work from your sophomore all the way to your senior year, and genuinely is one of the smartest women I've ever met. And she developed my personal writing skills far farther, farther than I think I could have been in other ways. Next, we have Dr. Celestino. She'll be in charge of helping you in your junior and senior year with AP research. Dr. Celestino is currently um, an admin with the Director of Faculty Development and Curriculum Instruction. But Dr. Celestino is extremely helpful where she has been had the opportunity to read these senior theses, like actual grad ones, and also AP research ones, and really help you to guide and create the best um, presentation and thesis that you can create. If there's someone to help you, it would be Dr. Celestino. Then we have the amazing duo. We have Mrs. Jacobs. So Mrs. Jacobs, she's affectionately known around the school, not only just for her support, but the way that she was able to teach you the things that you need to learn in the best possible way. And she is in charge of the AP World History and also AP Art History if you are currently in that class. Um, and she is our Juan Diego Academy's coordinator. Then we have, affectionately known as well, the man with the legend, Dr. Uh, Mr. Hauser, where Mr. Hauser will be helping you in AP Seminar. AP Seminar, he is going to guide you and he happens to just know basically everything and he will help you make those links where you can talk about um, Tarantino or you can talk about uh, Utah's heightened suicide rates but still make it so that you can research and hit ex exactly what you need to do to successfully complete these courses. 
I have to say that with the AP Capstone program, I, it built me into the student that I am today. That being said, that does not mean that it was an easy feat to do. I definitely had to sit and I had to learn the lessons that the program was meant to teach me, but through that I have learned time management skills. I can write an essay basically in my sleep and it be exact, like perfectly scored on a rubric, but it took work. Again, I still think it was absolutely worth it. I just want you all to be prepared. So next, I would like to introduce a couple more uh, perspectives. So first, I have Sophie Barakal, who is currently in AP Research. Hi guys, my name is Sophia Barakal, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my AP Capstone journey so far. So. Grizzly human remains, such as scalps, skulls, and cracked rib cages, have been found scattered throughout the Four Corners region of the United States, an area once inhabited by the ancient Native American group, the Anasazi. The severe damage to human remains has led researchers to believe that the ancient Anasazi practiced cannibalism. However, the living descendants of the Anasazi, the Hopi and Zuni Indians, deny any form of cannibalism practiced by their ancestors. What you just heard was the introduction to my group's final performance task in AP seminar last year in which we investigated whether or not the ancient Anasazi Native Americans practiced cannibalism. I investigated this through a religious perspective, analyzing whether or not ancient Puebloan beliefs coincided with, um, ancient, sorry, ancient Puebloan beliefs coincided with cannibalistic practices, or could explain evidence of bone modifications found. What I found is that seasonal witch cruises could explain many of the human remains found at Anasazi sites. For example, on the screen here, you can see an Isleta watercolor painting depicting corpse pounding, an Anasazi funerary rite in which, in, in which corpses were pounded in order to present, prevent evil spirits from inhabiting the body. After months of research, I presented my final thesis sometime in late February. I consider the development of this thesis one of the proudest achievements in my life and the most formative experience thus far. I think AP Seminar is one of the most influential classes you can take at Juan Diego. In order to come to my conclusion and build my thesis, I had to comb through countless sources recommended to me by Mr. Hauser himself, scholarly sources written by archaeologists, cultural experts, primary sources. I even had to look at artworks, as you've seen. It eventually got to the point where I could identify an author's argument, evidence, and reasoning with a simple skim of the paper. I think sometime in November of last year, I realized how much this impacted the rest of my classes beyond AP Seminar. I found that this skill helped with almost anything, English and history essays, ACT reading passages, and even a quick read of my science textbook. It still astonishes me how integral argument analysis has been to my high school career. I'm now a junior in AP research, and I just finished conducting my study investigating whether or not villains in children's animation films should perform pro-social or helping behaviors. Social cognitive theory suggests that children learn not only from direct experience, but from observation of similar role models. A central tenet of this theory is self-efficacy, an individual's belief in their ability to perform a behavior. Essentially, it's an idea of, if they can do it, so can I. While this theory has been tried out with pro-social heroes, I set out to find whether watching a clip in which an aggressive character or a villain performing helpful acts that have a stronger effect on children's subsequent helping behavior in a puzzle task than a character who had committed consistently pro-social acts, or a hero. I found that villains do indeed have a stronger effect on helping or pro-social behavior, likely because of the importance of this similarity or self-efficacy idea in observational learning. While heroes are certainly admirable, they're not always relatable. We're not all good all the time. Overall, before it helped build my reading, writing, and performance skills, AP Capstone helped build my confidence. Because of AP Capstone, I was able to be 15 years old, contributing to a scholarly field of research. Now, at the age of 16, I've discovered something that not even my AP Psychology textbook knows yet. AP Capstone and its brilliant community of teachers and students have helped real make me realize how capable I am. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you. I'd now like to present Thomas Varghese.
words. Um, oh, there you go. Okay, good evening. My name is Thomas Verghese, and I did both AP Seminar and AP Research. Um, my AP Seminar project was influenced heavily by Mr. Hauser, and it was investigating what the true origin of the Thirty Years' War was. Now, the Thirty Years' War is a war in the 17th century between the primarily the Habsburgs, who were a powerful noble family, and the principalities of the Holy Roman Empire. And the traditional viewpoint on this war is that it was conduct, or pardon me, is that it was fought for religious reasons, that it was the Protestants versus the Catholics. However, I took a more cynical approach on this, and I said that it was just a war that was fought for political power, and the public were manipulated into fighting this uh, deadly war that resulted in two thirds of the German population being killed. As you can see in the image uh, up above, the German citizens are being hanged. It was a common occurrence during this deadly war. Um, this war was more deadly than the World War I and World War II. My, for my lens, I took the Habsburg supremacy lens in that, pardon me, in that I investigated, um, I investigated research for secondary sources by, from scholars at many universities on the Thirty Years' War in order to determine whether or not it truly was a political motivation for this war and that if the public were manipulated. Um, both me and my group came to the determination that it was a political, that it was a result of politics that this war happened rather than for any religious reasons. As um, I took the Habsburg Supremacy Lens, as I said, my friends Amber Clazo took the Franco Hap the Franco Habsburg Alliance lens. My friend Connor Cutshaw took the Danish lens, and my friend uh, Cole Portman dissented from us and decided to take the trad traditional lens. But overwhelmingly, we found support that the Thirty Years' War was indeed fought as a war. The primary evidence we used for this was an alliance between the Catholic French and the Protestant Swedish, in order as the Catholic French and the Protestant Swedish. Um, had an alliance together in order to fight against the Catholic Habsburgs, which indicates that there was no real religious reasons involved. Um, additionally, in AP research, I had the pleasure of conducting an internship at the University of Utah. I got accepted, along with my friend Amber Poiseau, into the Cheatham Lab, which is a lab for molecular dynamics, which essentially can be computer simulations of biological molecules. And I conducted my research report on what the impact of different carbon-2 ribose modifications on the binding ability of antisensitive oligonucleotides. What antisensitive oligonucleotides, which are actually pictured there, um, that is a picture that I got from my simulations, what antisensitive oligonucleotides do is they bind to mRNA produced from transcription in target disease skips, uh, target disease cells. Some of you may be in biology, you may know what I'm talking about that um, in transcription, mRNA is produced, which is then turned into a protein, essentially, um, during translation. This is how all disease proteins are made. This is how HIV and other viruses and uh, diseases work. My, the antisensitive nucleotides that I was studying have been used uh, in studies on, um, on preventing HIV and also uh, different parasites, such as the Lakes Mania parasite. I say the modifications of these in order to determine the impact and the binding ability, as these modifications are necessary in order to um, necessary to ensure that the structure of the antisensitive oligonucleotides remains whole when they're inside of the cell. And I um, ended up running some simulations and then testing the binding ability of these antisensitive oligonucleotides. And it's really through this internship that I had that I met a lot of great people. I met Dr. Thomas Cheatham and Dr. Rodrigo Berlindo, two people who are very famous in the field of molecular dynamics. And additionally, I'm currently building a research report with the help of Dr. Celestino in order to explain my results, which I will then present at a science fair and hopefully publish in the paper if uh, everything goes well. So the AP Capstone has really done a lot for me in helping me learn how to write professional paper that could be published in a journal. I have now three essays that I'm able to publish, one on Napoleon, one on the Thirty Years' War, and one on 
uh, John Locke's Natural Rights, all that were conducted th through the AP seminar, that um, with the editing of Mrs. McConnell, I, they were able to look professional. As my writing before I came to the AP Capstone program was quite abysmal, I couldn't really make uh, very logical sentences, and I struggled to write a full research report. But through the AP Capstone program, I was able to learn how to write these papers. I was able to learn how to conduct these research experiments on my own, um, getting help from other people. And it's really been a very exciting and very helpful process. And I would encourage all of you to join AP Capstone. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Blair Eureka. So I'm Blair Eureka. I'm kind of different in that I finished AP seminar, but I didn't take research. So I finished AP seminar totally with the intention of taking AP research. And my junior year, I had also taken AP environmental science along with world and seminar with the idea that maybe taking that class would help me narrow my interests and then I would know what I wanted to investigate in AP research. But I ultimately decided that I didn't want to take AP research quite yet my junior year. And I would rather take other AP classes that might help me narrow my interests. But I just want you to know, like, that's Ms. Jacobs, Mr. Hauser, they were okay with that. I still have the opportunity and I'm still considering taking it next year. But taking AP Capstone doesn't automatically commit you to AP research. You don't have to feel like you are picking your whole entire high school career right now today for the next three years. You can take it at your own pace. But nonetheless, taking AP Seminar and AP um, World History have helped me in all the classes that I've taken so far. I learned how to effectively research as well as time management since there are a lot of strict time deadlines. And I honestly made some of my best friends through the class. For my actual AP seminar group presentation, my question was something a little unique. So I investigated, does Vlad the Third Dracula fit the model of an exemplary multivalued prince? So Vlad the Impaler is more commonly known as being the inspiration for Dracula, like the, the book character, the movie character. And he ruled Wallachia, which is located in Romania in the 15th century. And in AP World History, we had learned about a guy named Machiavelli, who is a political philosopher who wrote The Prince. And he believed that leaders need to be feared but not loved, be of the people, and that they need to have justification for the cruelty that they had. And I explored, I explored the comparative lens. So I, taught, I had to investigate other notorious historical figures that might fit into Machiavelli's ideal. So I investigated Elizabeth Bathory, which is, who is known as the female Dracula, and how she ruled, but was really not, had a weird reputation, I'll just say that. <laughs> and I also investigated Cesare Borgia, which was who the prince was inspired about, who was also another notorious ruler. And honestly, I don't think we've ever had to learn about Vlad the Impaler, in any history class, and my group was extremely excited that we were able to learn and take a deep dive into such a weird and unique topic with the encouragement of our teachers. But with that being said, it was not easy at all finding information about this topic. We had to learn how to research through a bunch of different places with the help of Ms. Jacobs and Hauser, of course. And um, we were really encouraged by them along the whole way to find new sources, and they just gave us the confidence to keep going. And then for my individual presentation, I also ended up doing something kind of a little specific. I was investigating if the flawed virtues in Jonathan Swift's version of happiness in Gulliver's Travels create a critique for modern society. Again, not very many people have written about this subject, so I had to figure out kind of a different lens that I could figure out. So I was investigating collective happiness and virtue, and Mr. Hauser, luckily, was able to help me out and gave me this paper from Alan Bloom, who is an American political philosopher. And honestly, I don't think I would have ever had the opportunity to write 
and read philosophical papers about books that were written in like the 16th century. And it was really cool because it was a book that I had read in middle school and I was able to analyze it in depth in the way that I wanted. Um, even though I didn't take AP research, I'm still incredibly grateful for the community that AP Capstone has given me. Like I said, I've made so many friends and I've made such good connections with my teachers and I honestly don't think I could have succeeded in the program without them and without all of their advice. So I strongly encourage you to consider AP Seminar and AP World, even if you're not so sure about AP Research quite yet, because it opens so many doors. And now I'd like to welcome Callum Goodwin. All right, I am Callum Goodwin. Uh, I'm a junior at JD. Currently, I've taken AP Seminar, and I'm currently taking AP Research. Uh, when I took AP Seminar, I looked at whether uh, Adam Smith's economic ideologies would function properly in the Confucian Moral Society. Uh, this led to me and the members of my group both reading uh, sections of The Wealth of Nations and The Analects, as well as secondary sources on both Adam Smith and Confucius by multiple college professors. The uh, seminar was an incredibly good class. I met Mr. Hauser, who was a great teacher, and he taught me a lot in both uh, philosophy, he gave me a couple books to read, and he's now helping me find colleges. A uh, really, really great teacher. And it also helps you work with reading, writing, time management, and cooperative work with multiple different groups. I'm currently taking AP Research, where my project is how does military service affect an individual's political economic opinions. Uh, in the bottom there, you can see the, uh, one of my preliminary results graph, which is suggesting so far that it doesn't really affect them at all. Uh, which is okay, you're allowed to come up with inconclusive uh, results or results suggesting that the hypothesis was incorrect. Um, your research, yeah. AP Research is also a fantastic class, uh, working with uh, Dr. Celestino, who's also a great teacher, really helpful, and really pushes you to do your best. Uh, so the benefits of uh, taking the capstone program involve like, some individual benefits, such as, as I mentioned before, reading, writing, cooperative work, uh, social benefits. So when I, was, when I first took seminar, I was relatively new to the school. I'd moved here from London in England. Uh, I didn't have that many friends, and the Capstone program was where I met a lot of friends that I'm very close with to this day. It was a really great program, and it really helps you out socially. Uh, it also helps with cooperative pro uh, project work, which is fantastic because you do a lot of that in college and it really prepares uh, you for that. Uh, you also work with people that you otherwise may not have worked with, which allows you to get to work with different uh, conflicting personalities and work around that for a better overall sense of what you'll be doing in college. And now, thank you, uh, now Ms. Jacobs to talk about the next steps. privilege of teaching all of these students and as I'm sitting there I was like these are the smartest people I have ever seen like some of those topics are unbelievable and they've done an amazing job so thank you very much for sharing this evening so for us to be good stewards of your time we're almost wrapping up if you have any questions you'll be able to stay after and we'll be more than happy to answer those questions so what happens now if you are interested in applying for AP Capstone. We have applications down here. Because of COVID, though, we'll hand them to each person individually if you're interested in that. And so if you'll give me just a second once we finish, if a few of our students will, we have some hand sanitizer there and then we can pass those out. If you want a digital version of the application, if you email me, I can send you a digital version as well. Those applications will be due no later than 3.30 p.m. on March 5th. So that'll be a week from this Friday. On March 4th, we will have our school-wide testing of pre-ACT. There is a cutoff that we like students to have before they can join the AP Seminar class and AP World History. It's not required. If a student has the drive, and the desire that will make up for the lack in the 
reading score, we will allow them to enter AP capstone. It's important to know, though, as parents, that they will be at a disadvantage if they are not reaching a certain reading score. So I would encourage students to make sure that you do your absolute best on that testing day of March 4th, and parents encourage your students as well to do their best so that we get the highest score possible. In early May, a letter of acceptance or denial will be sent to all of those students who apply. And then conditionally, to continue with the AP Capstone program, you will have summer work. Any portion of the summer work that is not completed will remove you from AP Seminar. Our experience has shown us, and we're now in our sixth year of AP Seminar in the AP world, that if students do not complete the summer work, the chances of them successfully completing the course are minimal. They generally don't make it through the first semester. So if you want to take this course, you must complete the summer work. Okay. At this point, if you would like to, if you grab some hand sanitizer, if you want to grab an application, you're free to go. If you have questions, we will answer those now as well. Anybody? Okay. Perfect. We'll be available for questions if you have any. And thank you for coming.